out here in southern Alberta. And essentially what we've seen is the migration south then of the Sahara into areas of grassland where the society today, and there are estimated, the recent estimates from the United Nations is that there are 500,000 uh, people from Senegal to Chad uh, now on the verge of starvation because of uh, that, that climate change. The wells are dry, the uh, crops are gone, um, and in many cases the grass is gone for the grazing of, of, of animals in connection with it. And we have seen as well with both the Ivory Coast here and with Libya, recent civil wars that have seen the migration then back of people who were working in those countries uh, to their home territory. And aid is only temporary in connection with this. And the de destabilizing of society that's involved with this then is a global problem uh, emerging out of climate change and is a systems problem because you don't solve it by just giving aid today. We're dealing with uh, uh, the intensification of a variety uh, of problems. I want to turn now from Africa to something that's very close to home and something which is very much part of the current government's uh, Arctic strategy in connection with Canada. And first of all, you must turn your head right around. We're so used to looking at Mercator projections of the Arctic region in which it's open-ended at the top. And what I'm asking you to do, just for a moment now, is turn around and look straight down from the North Pole on a circumpolar projection in which we've gone then profound systemic change is beginning to take place in, in this area. And just most of you, I'm sure, have heard quite a bit about this, but what we're seeing is in areas like the Mackenzie Valley, for instance, uh, here in the Canadian, um, three to four times the rate of climate change and temperature increase that we uh, have seen elsewhere in, in terms of global averages. What does that mean? That means uh, a melting of the permafrost, which is the foundation upon which everything is based. Any of you of engineering background, the way in which now foundations in the Northwest Territories have to be reassessed for the 40 or 50 year life of that building is huge. Your Antarctic pipelines, same issue, Alaska or, or Canada in connection with it. We're also into the melting of the sea ice yeah, we have been so damn lucky in this country. Nature has protected our Arctic. We haven't. But that day is ended as the sea ice, sea ice melts and others begin to take a real interest. The EU now has a formal policy on the Arctic. Uh, China is actively involved in Arctic research. The world is coming to our doorstep because one, it's opening up, and two, a quarter of the potential oil reserves in the world are off Siberia, Alaska, uh, the Canadian area, Greenland, etc. in connection with it. I was just in Norway, the extreme north of Norway this past summer, and once again, the Russians and the Norwegians have just got, come to an agreement uh, in connection with this area around Svalbard. So what am I trying to say here is I'm trying to say is that when we begin to look at the circumpolar world, we're looking at a whole new world today because of climatic and other systems change. We're looking at the fact that Canada has a boundary dispute with the United States. The extension of the land boundary between Alaska and Canada out into the Arctic Ocean. We do not have agreement on it and the Americans and the Canadians have differing systems in which to do it. And both are wanting to sell the oil rights to drill in that area very soon. And if the Canadians and the Americans aren't enough of a problem, the Russians have polar ridges coming into this area that they claim means they have sovereignty uh, into Alaskan or Canadian waters in connection with it. So uh, 
I'm just trying to explain this in, in terms of the way in which, on the one hand, natural systems changing then are changing fundamentally the geopolitical context in which the whole Arctic is being viewed today in connection with it. Now, I just want to finish up uh, in a minute or two and then open for some questions. Now, I, I can sure see the look on your faces. It's all very well and good, but what does a systems analysis diagram look like? And I'm just going to show you one right now in connection with it. And before you get too uh, discouraged, I'd like to give you a bit of an explanation of what. This looks horrible, doesn't it? But we've got energy sources on one side. And we've got energy uses on the other. And if you were trying to define Canadian policy today, or you're trying to define what we should be doing in terms of international negotiations, or even what some of the social implications of all of this may be, then you want to start on one side with, in this case, uranium. Canada's such a large producer. Here's hydro. Here's natural gas. Here's biogas biomass, coal, petroleum, etc. And on the other side, we have a whole variety of uses and exports for that energy. So that when we're trying to talk about now, what does CO2 regulation in Canada mean? We can begin to track what this means in terms of nuclear power, hydro, natural gas, um, and coal in connection with it. And conceptually, it's getting around through modern computer simulations the way in which you can then begin to map out to the degree that it's possible. And I emphasize the degree it's possible because this is based on assumptions and assumptions change. But nonetheless, this begins to give you some basis for them uh, trying to understand these, all these different forces that are happening in connection with it. And just in finishing up, I just want to say a couple things. First of all, when uh, I was an executive back at Transalta uh, for 10 years, my greatest challenge, both from an energy point of view and from an environmental point of view, was integration. And that sounds like a very simplistic kind of concept. But if business is able to actually manage something, they have to integrate the different factors in order to come to it. And what you don't measure, you, ne you will never manage. And so is some of this stuff tough, difficult, and complicated? Yes, it is. But in management and business, we're moving to new structures and new means of trying to do it. And if some of you have been involved, uh, as I have been, in the enterprise risk management, the development of methodologies for, uh, for enterprise risk management, then this is some of what we're coming back to. Secondly, there is an urgency from a time point of view whether it's in oil sands or shale gas or coal or renewables, there is an urgency for us to begin to define solutions. And we have tended in the past to be very ad hoc in our approach, and we have tended to make mistakes and have unintended consequences of public policy, which once again, this kind of system is designed to do. And the last thing I want to say is that sustainable development, if you really believe in it, is a systems approach. It's the greatest systems approach challenge that we've ever faced in our planet. And this is why your deliberations for the rest of the day are important to you and important in the wider sense of developing some of the new tools, uh, new ideas, 
and new ways of doing things which are so desperately needed. And I want to thank you all this morning for this opportunity of sharing a few ideas with you. And I'm open to questions from now until 10.15. And if that clock's right, I think we have eight minutes or, uh, or so for questions right now. Please go ahead. Yes, please go ahead. Um, in your view, when integrating different systems, because we have so many different systems and providers and, and stakeholders and whatnot, what is the chief, um, I guess, the chief thing to overcome? Is it regulation barriers or is it something else? I would say it's inertia. Um, and this is going back to my business experience and also the work I've done for the National Roundtable of Vice Government. And I, is we all, in our minds, have a kind of steel chain of ideas we work from. <clears throat> and in so many cases, the leadership of government and the leadership of business is from a generation ago, not even the present generation, let alone the generation coming ahead. So in terms of trying to break through in terms of the new ideas that we're talking about, in many cases, it can be regulation. In other cases, it's economics. In other cases, it's technical capacity. And I'm not trying to ignore any of those three. But I think the greatest thing, from my own experience, has been the intellectual inertia of people to think about new ways of doing things. They're so comfortable in the way in which they do things, and they're reluctant. And this is where um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited um, in terms of the way in which I see in business today, uh, people in their 30s now penetrating to uh, management positions. Not the top yet, but middle management where they can really begin to do some influence. The other thing is I think right now, we're, as I tried to say to begin with, we're in a period of political change, a really fundamental political change. Where it's all gonna end, I don't know, but there's a real chance uh, I think that we're going to see 10 or 15 years from now some fundamental changes on energy and environment. Other, other questions? Uh, you, at the start, you spoke about how you've gone to Africa and seen some very good private sector as well as public private partnerships going yeah. on. Could you tell us maybe sure. some specifics of what yeah. you saw out there? That's a really good question, and thank you for it. Um, can I just give you a story? Because I have a view that's different, and that's why your question is, is, is so important. In Nairobi, uh, two years ago, uh, the, the ISO 14000 process was, was hosted by the, the Kenyan government for meetings there. And um, they asked me to run a workshop for their business, uh, for the local business folks in connection with it. And when, um, the meeting started at 8.30, we were due to finish at 11. Um, at quarter to two in the afternoon, and I'd been on my feet for the whole time uh, with the deputy minister of the, the Kenyan government, and uh, we were exhausted. We had expected about 30 businesses to show up. I think we had 150. And what they were so determined to try and do was to try and develop products which were environmentally appropriate for Africa, but would also get them into the EU. And the ISO label, the standards label, was the solution they saw in connection with it. So do they have the money to set up a regulatory system the way uh, we would do it here in Canada? No, they don't. They don't have the labs, they don't have, they have some very talented people, please, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that. But government resources are limited. And a standards approach allows company by company them to use the experience of North America or Europe without out adding significantly uh, to their cost per unit of production in connection with it. And I think this trade issue is now becoming so critical in the environmental field that this kind of linkage is, is very important. Or I come back to, to the oil sands. The oil sands are having to penetrate the American market. What's the problem for pipelines uh, penetrating the American market right now in it, its environment? So this wider issue than just, uh, I'm trying to say. But I was really impressed. And the, 
number of African countries today that are active on our International Environmental Standards Organization is great. Every one of the North African states, including Libya, is involved in connection with it. Um, and it's, uh, to me, that's exciting. Is it gonna solve all the problems? No, it's not. But I see a greater political will today in Africa to try and deal with some of this than I did five years ago in terms of some of the negotiations. So we're not there, but I do see, and the important thing for Africa is what's happening within Africa. It's not what's happening in Kyoto or elsewhere. It's the indigenous development of management ideas and, and this kind of thing. So that's a very personal point of view in connection with it, but I hope it addresses at least some of your concerns. Yes? Yeah, you didn't mention about what the base looks on to mention the uh, same reality and all the other things. Yeah. I can build the countries in most Africa. It's where they don't have enough power to move around the world they would have. How yeah. do you, how the system like that be integrated into like a more functional system or an insufficient system? Okay, first of all, when we're dealing with your situation in West Africa, the financing questions become absolutely critical in, in connection with it. And in so many instances, uh, what we're trying to do is see ways in which we see partnerships develop. Uh, CDM was one means of partnerships developing. This is the clean development mechanism. Um, another of the things, and I was just trying to, God, I, I just read, two days ago about one of the West African countries and General Electric or one of the other big US uh, wind power producers signing an agreement in which they, you may know which yeah, one it was, I, I, I forgot, yeah, yeah. my apologies. Was it uh, but, Lesotho? Sorry? Lesotho? Well, no, it was one of the West African oh, countries, sorry. Yeah, but it was in the Wall Street Journal and maybe it was a dubious source, I don't know. But anyway, uh, the point I'm trying to make is sometimes you see these things that are advertising for the American company much more than they are necessarily good time. But these kind of partnerships are what we need. Because what we're trying to do right now is achieve a basis for electricity generation at a price that the local market can bear. And that question of of cost then becomes critical in connection with it. But if we can get wind power, we can get new wells, we can do a whole variety of things that are much wider from a social point of view than just the electricity generation in connection with it. But one of the discouraging aspects of Durban was that the developed countries did not come forward with the means to deliver the $100 billion a year in climate change technology funding and others uh, that was hoped for in connection with it. So to a certain extent, we're required, we're falling back for the future on less reliable sources of financing. I think I'm right on my time here. And before I get yanked off the podium here, thank you all very much. All the very best for the rest of the day and, and your continuing work in this area. And to our friends in India, we're delighted that this kind of linkage is taking place. So thank you for your participation too.